Welcome everyone uh, to the CCCOER webinar for May um, on the importance of student collaboration in OER projects. And we have three colleges who are going to tell you about the work they're doing to include students in the process and to improve the process um, with those students. So it's, uh, it's really exciting to, to hear about these. This is Una Daly, uh, Director of CCCOER, um, with you this morning. And um, very quickly, here is our uh, overview for today. Um, after our brief introductions, we will um, hear first from, oh, actually, I'm sorry, the agenda is slightly out of order. We will hear first from Philip Anaya and Lori Coleman, who are at the Alamo Colleges. And next, we will hear from Trudy Ratke and Brian Weston at College of the Canyons. Um, and kind of exciting here, um, Trudy's a student <laughs> uh, who works on OER, so we're really lucky to have her join us today. And finally, we will have Megan Dempsey, who is a librarian at the Raritan Valley Community College in um, New Jersey, who will be sharing um, some of the work that her students are doing to support advocacy at her college. So I want to just take a moment to let everyone say hello. And I think we're going to start with um, Philip and uh, Lori. Hello. Yes, it's oh, go ahead, Philip. Sorry. <laughs> no, yes, it's correct. It's Philip and I from Alamo Colleges. And I'm Lori Coleman. I'm the OER coordinator and English professor and the chair of the OER task force. Great. Thank you, Philip and Lori, for joining us today. And for those of you who are in the audience, um, welcome uh, um, to um, our event today. And please um, introduce yourself in the chat window um, and let us know where you're at and anything, any OER projects that you want to share with us in the chat window. So next, I'd like to turn to uh, Trudy and Brian to say hello. Hi, uh, my name is Trudy Radke. I'm an OER assistant here at College of the Canyons. I have a bachelor's degree in history, and I'm a former COC student. And I'm Brian Weston. I'm the director of Distance and Accelerated, Accelerated Learning, and uh, yeah, just happy to be here and to hear about the other colleges and see what everyone else is doing as well. Great. Thank you so much, Trudy and Brian. Um, <clears throat> we're really thrilled to have you. And uh, finally, um, I'd like to give Megan Dempsey a moment to introduce herself. Megan? Hi, I'm Megan Dempsey. I am the library chair and instructional services librarian at uh, Raritan Valley Community College. And I've also been serving as the convener of our OER faculty interest group through our Center for Teaching and Learning for the past year. Great. Thank you for coming, Megan. And she's got some exciting stuff to share about what her students are doing to support the work there at Raritan. All right. Oh, and thank you, everyone, for introducing yourself in, in the chat window. That's wonderful. It's, we have folks from all over the country. Um, so I, just for those of you who this might be your first time joining us, um, the Community College Consortium for OER was founded 10 years ago. Um, and our mission remains largely the same, um, expanding awareness and access to high quality OER uh, for all of our colleges. Um, and we do this by supporting faculty choice and development and these monthly webinars and other activities that we make available to our members are part of that. Um, you know, at the, at the base, at the heart of all of this is improving student success and that's what we've been attempting to do for the last 10 years, and we're so glad that um, we can help colleges with that work. Um, here's a quick view of our membership map. Um, and in fact, uh, Raritan Valley is one of our newer members that joined us uh, just within the last few months. And so we're just thrilled to have them. Uh, they're located in New Jersey. Uh, we just had another college, another new college join us uh, in Massachusetts, which is Massasoit Community College. And I'm not sure if they're online today, but uh, we're very pleased to have them as well, along with all of our existing members. You can see them there in the in the blue and red uh, dots on the map. So, um, I think we're gonna get right to our speakers here. I just wanted to um, point out that kind of the threads of this webinar about the importance of student collaboration in OER projects, um, often this is thought of as almost 
an afterthought. We often were focusing on the faculty, uh, the librarians, the instructional designers, the administrators who are um, helping to get this work done uh, and deliver this OER materials to students. And um, sometimes it's only later in the process that actually uh, bringing students in is thought of. And so it's really exciting to hear uh, from some of these colleges and, and they're gonna tell you their story. Uh, and they, it's a wide variety. But as I mentioned earlier, Megan Dempsey from Raritan, they're relatively new to OER. They've um, really been doing this for a few years. They've had one or two faculty who've been doing it, and now they're really starting to rev up. But their student government has been supporting them. So um, they're coming in early um, on this with having the students support that, and it's really wonderful to hear that. Uh, we're also going to hear, of course, from um, Alamo College and how they're helping to create awareness among students and how students can um, have uh, dialogues about um, what OER and free textbooks um, make possible for them. And finally, uh, we're going to hear from um, the folks at College of the Canyons, Trudy, who's a student there who uh, works on collaboration with faculty on developing OER. Uh, and she works for Brian there, who's the director of um, distance learning. And he has a whole team um, of students who work with faculty on finding openly licensed materials, uh, particularly images and with formatting um, open materials that the faculties are producing, um, which is a benefit, of course, for the faculty, but also for the students. It's, it's a wonderful um, work for them to do um, and to understand um, this new open education model. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to Philip and Lori, um, and I will stop sharing my screen so that, that you can uh, share yours, Lori. Great, thank you, Una. Okay, so the, um, the Alamo Colleges District OER uh, focus began with the formation in the fall of 2015 with our district-wide OER committee. And it was in response to the first charge by our chancellor regarding OER. So that committee was made up of various stakeholders, faculty, librarians, college administration, Philip as the digital and OER coordinator for the district, and led by the district's vice chancellor of academic success. So the committee worked through the summer of 2016 to revise the guidelines for adopting instructional materials to reflect the work that some faculty across the district had already begun with OER adoption. So by the time the committee concluded its work, we finalized the instructional material guidelines a contract with our college UPS store for low-cost on-demand printing of OER for students who want that option was established and a plan began to tag courses in our district-wide schedule of classes so that students could search and select courses that are designated as OER or no-cost materials. So once the guidelines were finalized, we received support from both our college president and our vice president of academic success with regards to growing the OER adoption on, uh, across our district, uh, but specifically on my campus, San Antonio College, that I'm going to primarily focus on. So our vice president then assigned the Teaching with Technology Committee to take the lead. So the OER task force was created in the fall of 2016 as a subcommittee of the Teaching with Technology Committee, and then I was named chair of the task force. In the spring of the, of, of the following year, um, the Alamo, well, actually the spring of that same year, 2016, we joined, Alamo Colleges joined the Achieving the Dream OER degree initiative if, as part of this eight member Texas consortium. And that work continues with Philip as the lead. Um, and in the summer of 2016, the Alamo Colleges also became one of only 11 universities and colleges and the only community college in Texas selected by Rice University-based publisher OpenStax to be a member of its National OER Institutional Partnership Program. So this OpenStax partnership was a one-year plan to develop a sustainable model and strategic plan using OER in the district, and that work really galvanized our efforts to grow OER adoption across the district, as well as the Achieving the Dream grant. So that in the 
fall of that year, 2016, the task force received a charge from our vice president to conduct an inventory of cu current courses that are you that use some or all of the uh, OER. And we were also charged to discuss ways we can scale up our OER use. Then to determine the barriers to those who don't use OER and come up with recommendations for incentives for faculty. Some of those have been accomplished with a faculty survey, a focus group session with department chairs, and uh, several workshops, and then aware awareness events for faculty and students. Um, currently, we're working on two videos to, again, spread awareness. We have a faculty showcase video that highlights four faculty on our campus, San Antonio College, who are either using OpenStax or other uh, open content in their courses in lieu of publishers textbooks and then we're also working this summer on a student awareness video that we have compiled from students within those courses and uh, we're hoping to develop that over the summer and then finally we have some short two-minute videos that we're also going to create informational videos what is OER so that we can share those on our social media sites for the college all right, Philip, if you'd want to take the next. Yes, one second. Um, I'll, I'll start this by saying I'm actually on the plane right now and I have a buddy staring, at me, staring at me, so I probably should have had. Can't hardly hear you. It's just a little louder, Philip. I've been flying since 6 a.m. and I got offered a bump, so I took it um, and I have around eight minutes so uh, going off of what Laurie said we focused on branding uh, we have a unique structure at Alamo colleges where we have five independently accredited colleges and their identity is important to them in our seated, we are waiting for passengers you do not change seats until the door has been closed so Philip if you'd like me to I can go ahead and speak on this slide if you'd like me to you, can you hear Mm, we're, you're falling away a little bit and we can hear a lot of the background noise. So I think that what, what Philip wanted to add about our branding is that he really took the lead to try to get some of the iconography, I guess, of what our institution and our district wants to use and create to get the message out uh, in a visual way. So you can see the brand at the top there of the slide, the Alamo Open slide. This is for SAC because it has a red background with the book and over it. Uh, we have five colleges in our district. So Philip created a, a variation of this um, branding for each of the five colleges as well as for the district based on our colors that we're uh, designated in our district. And then we've been trying to develop the websites. Uh, the district website here on the left is what Philip's uh, area focuses on. And then our college website is on the left. It's not easy to see, but you can certainly go to the website. It's uh, if you search for Alamo College I'm sorry, San Antonio College OER, you, you can find this website. Uh, we've tried to place on the far right column a place where students can click and see the courses that are using OER at SAC. And also we have a place where students can find OER uh, as it relates to their particular courses. And so Philip's goal is to replicate what we have at SAC as a model across all five of our sister or other four sister colleges by uh, creating a task force and then um, creating more awareness through the involvement of those faculty who either are already currently using OER or who have a desire to uh, innovate and become part of that group. Um, the next slide shows you what, again, Philip has been working on. On his end, we use the banner system and what Philip has done ha has to do with our class search schedule that students go to in order to find their courses. So as you can see, the students can search by subject, they can search by course number or title, and then they have the option to limit their search to only a specific college 
all colleges or multiple colleges, um, and even the parts of the term. But the new addition that you see down on the bottom is the location or attribute. So Philip has worked to create this Alamo Open no-cost textbook attribute so that we can help students again to find those courses that that they know they aren't going to have to purchase costly materials for. And it's also going to help us on the back end to identify what kind of choices our students are making with regards to these types of no cost textbook courses. Um, and that's also going to help us know what what kind of high impact courses are being um, maybe looked for by students who they know have these OER options. And so finally, um, the last thing we wanted to talk about is that, uh, oh, I should have said, I apologize, I should have given some shout out to the uh, collection of data Philip has generated. Um, this semester district wide, 240 faculty were identified as having adopted the low cost or free instructional materials. And we've estimated that this semester we've saved students 1.9 million due to the faculty adopting these uh, no cost materials and we're projecting that by fall of this year that amount will rise close to five million all right and so here you see on this screen the two campus events that philip led on two of our colleges one being san antonio college and it was again an, an attempt to grow student awareness for the OER initiative. So we pulled two strategies for the Oregon Open Student Toolkit on OER, and you can search uh, the internet for that toolkit, Oregon Open Student Toolkit. So we were hoping to harness the power of social media to shine the light on the student perspective when it comes to expensive textbook costs. So in one event, students were invited to write down on a dry erase board the amount of money that they spent on textbooks for the semester. Then on another board, write down what they would have spent that money on. And so several student responses reflected the economic choices students have to make that impact paying rent, gas, or entertainment. One of my students who spent over 200 said he would have liked to give give back his textbook money to his parents who could use it for home remodeling. And another student who spent $300 said she would use it to buy shoes and clothes for her son. And one student even expressed that her father lived out of state and she would have liked to use her textbook money to visit him. And then the other event was the used textbook graveyard. And we hope that this event would again shine a light on the impact that unnecessary new additions have on the used book market by setting up a graveyard for all the used books that can't be sold back. So Philip made all of these um, instruments that were used in both events. Uh, he made the gravestone shapes out of these outdoor sign materials that could be inserted into the ground. And then students, of course, labeled the signs with the titles of their used textbooks that they're not they were not going to be able to uh, sell back to the bookstores. And in conversations at these events with students, it was clear that the textbook costs were unavoidable and students realized that, but they also realized that it's not necessarily affordable. And that was an issue for, for several of the students. And then uh, Philip was um, generous enough to give all the students who participated a free t-shirt and on the t-shirt it contained that Alamo Open logo to again promote this initiative. And I believe I am done on my slides. All right, lovely. Thank you uh, for sharing that, um, Lori and, and Philip, who I think is now on an airplane. Um, and um, I thought what was um, particularly um, fun about you know you did that event during open education week which was in march and That's um, right. yes so it's a, it's a great opportunity to um to uh to um create campus awareness among students yes. and also faculty so Absolutely. really exciting and i know that you did that last year too that's so, right yeah. um that's wonderful thank you um any questions for Lori? We will, we will have questions at the end, but we just have a few minutes here. If, um, let's see, oh, we've got a question here from uh, Paige Wolf. Hi, Paige. Um, and her question was, is Alamo open just for OER does, or does it encompass other free and low cost materials? Yes, it's, it's both, both. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. And it looks like you got a lot of folks who loved uh, your textbook graveyard idea. <clears throat> All right. Um, now, 
Uh, Trudy and Brian, do you have control of the screen now? I yeah. believe so. We are all set. Wonderful. So I'm gonna, now I'm going to turn it over to Trudy and Brian, who are at College of the Canyons in California. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to have Trudy present first here. Great. So yeah, once again, I'm Trudy Radke, a former COC student, now an OER assistant at College Trudy, of Trudy, could you just speak up slightly? Yeah, sure. yeah absolutely. Thank um, you. Former COC student, now OER assistant at College of the Canyons. Um, and I work with a team of other students, brilliant students, who help instructors put together and design these OER textbooks and instructional materials. Great. So the part I'm going to touch on is student collaboration in OER, primarily in the actual creation of OER materials. And my idea for this was making textbooks stick. So how do we make textbooks that are affordable and free, which is a big selling point in OER, but also easy to access and easy for students to digest and not just a textbook that goes in one ear and out the other, but something that they can use and reuse and get a lot out of. Great, so I just have a little question up here. Why emphasize student collaboration in the creation of OER textbooks? And I think the real idea is because students understand the needs of students when students have a voice learning is achieved. So I think that there's a unique perspective that students bring into the textbook process, especially because the textbook experience for them is still very fresh. They're in school or they recently graduated and they understand the textbooks that they liked and they also remember the textbooks that they didn't like and maybe the money they spent on the textbooks that they didn't like. And so hopefully bringing students into this process makes it better for everyone. Great, yeah, so it ensures that these textbooks are created with students in mind. That's kind of the key point. Great, so now I'm gonna talk about um, what I think is a general idea for what constitutes a sticky textbook, what makes a textbook stick in a student's mind. And I think that there's three criteria for that. I think in general, uh, for a textbook to be a good choice for a student, it should be affordable, easy to use and understand, as well as stylistic and design conscious. So when we combine this general criteria for a good textbook and we bring in student collaboration, we get this unique new spin on a textbook in the world of OER that I think is really, really beneficial to current students. Great. So the first thing I want to touch on is affordable. Um, it's the easiest thing I think to talk about in OER, especially because it is one of the biggest selling points of OER is that it's free. Uh, one thing I do think that needs to be emphasized though is the free aspect needs to be emphasized to students. I've actually talked with a lot of, a lot of COC students when working on promotional materials here, and when I bring up OER, some of them, many of them have never heard about it, and when I explain that it's free textbooks, they're skeptical. They don't quite buy it. Um, so I think it's really important for students to be made aware of the OER process. It needs to be like a really, a campus-wide initiative to help them understand, no, this is, there is altruism in the world of education. These textbooks really are free. We want you to have access to them so that you have less of a burden financially in your college experience. And one way that COC does that is that we actually put our textbooks up right on our website. Um, a COC student can just go right to the website, they can click on a textbook and download it for free. Also, they don't even have to be a COC student since there's no login, any student could potentially just peruse these textbooks, download it if they wanted to, um, if they found the information was helpful for a current class they're taking, whatever they wanna do with that. So the second criteria for these kinds of textbooks is ease of use. So easy to find, I kind of already touched on that. COC tries to put our textbooks right on the website for students to access and make it really clear, really easy. But I think that another thing that goes along with accessibility or ease of use is, is the information easy to understand? Can students digest it? Will it stick with them? Um, and I think that our team has done a pretty good job of that. We worked on a water technology textbook, Water 32. Um, and sure, actually, we're going to try to pull it up right now. Great, so this is our textbooks page, and this is our water tech textbook. So I wanted to actually show this page first because this is a diagram that was created in Photoshop by a former COC OER assistant named Natalie Miller. So for this water tech textbook, there needed to be a visual diagram of a water bank. However, at the time of this textbook creation, no water bank diagram existed that was openly licensed. So uh, Natalie had some tech background, some tech experience, 
and she went into Photoshop and created this uh, diagram specifically for this textbook. And that's, I think, what I'm really trying to get at when I say ease of use is that this student collaboration OER, when, when, when students at a community college get to work with community college professors, we get this cool kind of collaboration where people from a tech background or an English background or a history background, they bring their skills to the textbook. And yes, the professor is writing the content. The content is definitely coming from the professor. But the COC student can bring in a tech skill like this and create something that is very unique and very specific for the COC students that are going to be reading this water technologies textbook. It makes it personal and it helps it just click a little better. So we have PowerPoint? Yeah, sure. Um, another thing I do want to touch on, although maybe it's not the first thing that comes to mind with ease of use, is um, another thing that we do here at College of the Canyons is we have to make all of our textbooks accessible in terms of 508 compliance. So screen readers for the visually impaired so that they can like have a comprehensive textbook experience as well. So for us, ease of use even translates to 508 compliance. We spend a lot of time on the alt text. We try to make it interesting. We try to make it comprehensive. Uh, we don't just want it to be a thing that we add at the end. We want it to be something that we really think out. We want to choose our images thoughtfully, and then we want to thoughtfully alt text them so that the visually impaired can also have a textbook experience that's comprehensive and feels inclusive and complete. Great, which kind of feeds into the last thing I want to talk about, which is, uh, I think, the third criteria for a good textbook, style and design. Um, I think that sometimes another issue that I would run into when promoting OER on campus is students would equate a free textbook with perhaps maybe a cheap textbook. So I think that this is something really important to highlight is that when you bring students in to help, professors are the content creators. They're the people that are, they're writing the content, they're vetting the sources, they're doing like the real work of the textbook. But the student assistants, they come in and they can really help tie it together in terms of style and design. They can make it um, aesthetic. They can really spend a lot of time on that alt text and make sure that everyone has a really like enriched textbook experience. And that's something that the professor doesn't always have time to do, to color code and to pick a color scheme and to try to make this all match and feel homey in a sense. Um, and that's what we try to do here at College of the Canyons. We try to help the professor create a continuity in the textbook because we're some of these sources are the professor's writing sources we're getting sources on the web and then we have to somehow bring all of that together into something that feels whole and complete and not like it just a bunch of random sources kind of loosely sewn together and i think the students appreciate it i think that they recognize it when they pick up a, a book and it's color coded and there's thoughtful alt text and it all feels like it belongs in the same place and that's why i want to emphasize that as well and that's a, a very brief overview, I think, of why student collaboration is so important in the world of OER. So yeah, OER is great on its own. OER creation, content creation is always fantastic. Uh, I think when you add student collaboration, it just, you get this extra special level and you get a textbook that is lasting, that sticks. You get a, a textbook that's content rich, but also student based student students are in mind when this textbook is created and I think that the students that use these textbooks they feel that at the end of the day they recognize it they see it and they appreciate it so this is Brian Weston I get to chime in I have such a wonderful job I have the pleasure of working with these wonderful uh, student workers in here and I just kind of wanted to touch briefly on how we kind of assembled that team where you can possibly find uh, those people to make a team of your own if you're interested. And then just that bottom bullet is what I think is a huge benefit that comes of having actual students working on the textbook. So uh, currently right now we actually have three OER staff members and I think it was kind of covered before, but they run the gambit of helping faculty with sentence level editing in the OER book, finding images for the book, as you can see, even creating images and media for them to use in the book, as well as formatting the OER textbook, which is a huge selling point that, or a huge service selling point that we're able to offer our faculty. A lot of our faculty are very interested in OER. You know, sometimes we get caught up in how to search for materials, 
And that's where we can kind of come in and say, hey, we have a team that can actually help you through the process, find those images, and really we can utilize faculty as the content expert for all of their knowledge. So that's what we really want from faculty is to know what uh, should be taught, what concepts we need to cover, and we can kind of dress it up and style it to make sure um, the students are receptive to that OER book as well. Um, so where do you look? Uh, we have a wonderful associated student government that has uh, a lot of students in there that are always looking to help out people in there. So we always try to reach and engage our ASG department. Uh, what I didn't picture here is our learning center. If you happen to have a tutoring center on your campus, um, I've worked out a really good relationship. We've happened to have borrowed quite a few of their tutors in there. But I think the advantage of having one of the tutor student workers that used to work there come work now for OER is they've worked with students, <coughs> excuse me, on their different textbooks, on their assignments. So they have a pretty nice grasp and understanding of what students are expected to know, expected to learn, as well as the other side of what the faculty are expecting. So they kind of have the content, I want to say they're content experts, but they at least have content familiarity in those subjects. And what we try and do is pick different people. So we currently have, uh, Trudy is wonderful in, I think, history. I think she has some English. She has some religion knowledge. So we have quite a bit of a resource with Trudy as well as her media um, skills. And we have another worker, uh, Mitchell, who is very much science-based and he's able to kind of pick up those concepts that go right over my head. And we also have another worker, Alexa, who is very skilled in English. And um, that's the sentence level editing that I think a lot of people appreciate. Uh, the reason I say you can also reach out if anyone out there is having maybe some, uh, I'll say challenges in working with a department and maybe adopting OER, uh, a really kind of nice um, strategy is to work with that department and ask them if they have any students that have really excelled that would possibly be interested in helping develop OER for the college. Uh, once you do that, hopefully you have a little inside nudge to say, hey, you know, we have this wonderful worker, they'd love to help find resources for that department. So it's kind of a nice way to really respect that department, work with them to really develop something for the betterment of everywhere else. Um, and then that last point I just wanted to say is the student focus group. Uh, we don't have time to really, you know, go out for the OER and say, you know, what exactly do you think about this book? You know, what would you modify? But when you happen to have student workers who have seen those textbooks, I feel like we have a kind of built in student focus group where we can, you know, pull their ideas, get their feedback in a quick manner instead of, you know, hosting a full focus group. But it gives us a kind of good glimpse of, is this going to be effective or, you know, kind of what are our thoughts on this and how can we proceed from here? And that goes right along and I didn't list it, but a social justice issue. Um, some of us, when we're writing textbooks, you know, we have certain frame of mind and not that we do it intentionally, but we can, you know, leave out other perspectives. And so our um, student OER staff has been wonderful and very, in a very diplomatic way has worked with faculty to say, hey, you know, Instead of just saying this name here, have you thought about using another name that might be more or more reflective of our student population? And I think that's really helped um, bolster our OER, really helps engage our students in OER. And I would say if you have the chance to have student workers on your OER team, I highly, highly encourage it. It's a wonderful experience for our students. It's a wonderful, I guess, different perspective for faculty to kind of see what students are expecting and. I think it's a, something I'd highly recommend if you have a chance to incorporate that in there. And I'll turn it back over to Una, I think, at this point. Great. Um, thank you so much, Trudy and Brian, uh, for sharing that. Uh, what an inspiration. Um, and there was, there was a question uh, that I saw, um, I think it was from Lori, actually. Lori, our, our previous speaker, and she was asking, can you tell her a little bit about the tools um, that are used to develop the um, that are used to develop the books and the materials. Um, sure. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure the tools, you're talking about like maybe what programs we use to help write our books or yes. what? Yeah. Yes. Uh, we're still actually, so we're looking into uh, press books. I think a lot of people are switching over to press books. We are still currently in 
uh, Word. And so we develop a lot of our things into Word and then we switch it over into PDF and check for accessibility after that. So uh, the reason we did that is we'll have the Word document we can send to our DSPS department in case they need to print it, do whatever they need to modify and make it accessible. And, um, but we are looking into press books at the moment. So, um, but currently we're still on Word and PDF to develop OER. Great, great. Thank you for sharing that. That's, I think that's really helpful. I think many faculty are comfortable with Word, so um, that's a good place to start them for sure. Um, let's see if there's any other questions here. Um, Pola says she likes the highlight from Trudy. Pola also is at College of the Canyons. Um, I like the highlight from Trudy that students need to understand the concept of OER in order to understand why they're low cost and or free. Yeah, I, I really think it's um, um, working on a project like this can really bring that home to students. And there was a question here from Nathan. Um, Brian, you might want to answer that one. Are the students work study students or are they postgraduate staff? Yeah, it, it depends. So I've actually, uh, the three people I've named um, have come in. Some have come in as students actually locally at COC, eventually kind of came to the tutoring center and came over here. Um, but we've had some other um, students come in. Um, it, yeah, it just depends. We'll, we'll welcome everyone. We try to get student workers first and then typically they turn into short-term employees because um, I think they like working in our department and they, they get the skill set to keep continuing from there. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of depends. But yeah, we'll welcome anyone with a student perspective. Wonderful. All right. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, hmm. Just one second here while we get to the appropriate place. We are next going to hear from um, Megan Dempsey and uh, at Raritan um, Valley Community College in New Jersey. Uh, Megan? Great, thank you. Um, so RVCC is really in its fledgling stages when it comes to OER, um, but we've made a lot of progress in this past year. Um, and once we started expressing interest and I started talking to my provost about it, she supported myself and three faculty members to go to the Open Ed Conference in Anaheim in October, which was an amazing experience. And we, while we were there, started talking about what the missing pieces are for our OER initiative because we had a faculty member who was trying to get some things off the ground for a couple of years. Um, and Una, you can just advance if you're able to, thank you. Um, so somebody had been trying to make some progress on OER on campus and just it was just not catching hold. So we started talking about why that was. And there's a few different reasons, but after seeing the presentations at the conference and hearing from students, we realized that for us a major missing piece were the student voices so we actually started emailing with the director of student life right from the conference and he told us that different iterations of SGA and I think I have a photo of the most recent EG, um, SGA group in there they had talked about OER and, and they recognize textbook costs as being a huge issue for students and I'm sorry that that Instagram photo did not translate properly here <laughs> um, but they also felt they were not able to make any traction and thought they were getting resistance from faculty and faculty just weren't interested in it so when we came back to campus and started talking to the current SGA leaders some more uh, we realized that the campus I think was primed to try this again. We had a core group of faculty who were really interested. We had a student government group of leaders who wanted to see progress made and saw the impact that textbook costs were having on their peers and really wanted to make a difference. So we started having some conversations around how that could happen. And another benefit that came out of the conference, um, you can go ahead to the next slide, was I met Caitlin Vitez, I hope I'm saying that correctly, from US PERG. And she and I just started talking about ways that we could motivate students, ideas that they, uh, things like the textbook graveyard and some of the ideas that were presented earlier, she started sharing with me. And we realized that Caitlin actually grew up a couple of miles away from RBCC. And she was heavily involved in Rutgers um, initiative to get some affordable textbook programs going and although she lives in DC now 
she was coming to New Jersey for Thanksgiving. So that worked out perfectly. And she volunteered to come to campus. She is fantastic. And she volunteered to come to campus and meet with our students. So she actually came to campus twice and met with our student government leaders. And what was really beneficial in that meeting was that they could really relate well to Caitlin. And she was able to give our students talking points for getting OER conversations started with faculty. She gave them quick data points that they could throw into conversations. And most importantly, I think she gave them the confidence to actually go out and start these conversations, which I think they were lacking. And the rest of us just hadn't really been able to to provide for them. So she gave them a wealth of knowledge in like 30 minutes and basically said to them, okay, stand up. I've got some petitions here. We're going to go knock on faculty doors and get them to sign them. And I think our students were a little taken aback and weren't quite sure what to do with that at the moment, but they did it. And that first day she came, they walked around campus for an hour and got six faculty signatures and just started talking to faculty members. So again, this just boosted their confidence tremendously and I think got them very excited about the fact that um, there were key faculty members out there who were interested in doing this. Um, so if you want to go ahead to the next slide, I have some more ideas that we got put in place in addition to starting to talk to faculty, and I think they've continued that petitioning through the semester. In the beginning of the spring semester, they um, did the textbook, hashtag textbook broke campaign on social media, similar to uh, what Alamo presented, and they stood outside of the bookstore on the first couple days of classes and had students write down how much they spent on textbooks and posted their pictures on social media and I think it was really fun for them and it, it raised awareness among other students and that was a great idea. Our current SGA president is also a very strong advocate, very outspoken person, which is great to have. And he's, you know, got an audience with the president and the provost. So every opportunity he gets, he's talking to them about how the students want the administration to really support faculty momentum around this. And I think hearing it at the administrative level from the students has been huge. We have a lot of administrative support to begin with, but that certainly added to um, our ability to get things done. The SGA passed a resolution, which I'll share in just a minute, supporting open educational resources. And they've also been pushing to get a list of courses that are zero cost available to students. Right now, unfortunately, there's only three official courses on that list, but because there was nowhere for it to really live, um, I volunteered to put it on the library's open education page. So I just started it there and am sharing it, but they really want to start having conversations with students and saying, hey, why don't you try this course and see what you think? And they're also asking for designations in Banner. And I love that idea of making it an attribution that can be a filter. So I'm hoping to go to my Banner people and see if they can make that happen. But they want to make sure that students are aware this is an option for them. And so the students are really pushing the administrative side to make those things happen, which I think is very positive. Um, and the next slide, I just have uh, an example of the resolution they passed. I think they got a template from Caitlin or from one of the student PERG sites and you know so they've got their very formal official language and some data in there and definitions and then if you advance one more their actual resolution to not only support educational resources but um, encourage the administration to support faculty in their movement towards this. And with that support, with the student advocacy, we were able to, our foundation was able to get us a donor um, to grant some funding to support stipends for faculty. So we're starting small, but we have come a tremendous way in 10 months. And I don't think we could have made as much progress or really gotten the donation we got without being able to say our students are strongly in support of this. Wow. <laughs> um, when Megan oh, okay, I thank you. For this, I had no idea about the background. That is amazing um, and shows how, how, how far you can come in a short period of time with um, the right resources and the right folks involved. Let's see, you've got a couple of questions <laughs> that are uh, coming out here. Um, okay. 
uh, ah, yes, Richard Hirschman made a comment, uh, which uh, you can take a look at. Yes, um, thank you. About the, the citation from the College Board and on um, costs. Yeah, great. Wow. Um, so, um, Thank you so much, um, Megan, for uh, sharing that with us. And I just want to go through just a couple of slides here, and then we're going to open this up to all our speakers um, and all of our participants, I should say, to um, ask questions. So we're, uh, we do keep a list on our website of all of these webinars, by the way, and their recordings. Um, it usually takes about 48 hours till we get, get it posted, because we do caption them. Um, we also keep a list of conferences. Um, that are coming up, um, national, primarily national, some regional, um, and that focus on open education, um, and we have submission dates and so forth. So it can be quite useful if you're planning your year ahead. And of course, um, we hope that many of you can come to Niagara Falls in October to the Open Ed 2018 conference. If you're not on our email list, you can apply to be on it by going to our website under community email. There's a button you can click that says join and it'll take you through that. Uh, thank you, Kiri. Yes, Kiri posted our um, open education conference link there in the chat window. She maintains that. Kiri is uh, our vice president of the website. Um, and in June, we're going to have a webinar on open platforms, um, really uh, also examining the CARE framework, which is the uh, stewardship OER framework that came out this last spring. And we will have Nicole Finkbeiner from OpenStax talking about how they work with vendors and what um, criteria they use. I think many of you know Nicole. And uh, Quill West, our president of CCCOER, will be our facilitator for that one. And we hope you can join us for that. And uh, now I, I once again want to say thank you so much to uh, our student, uh, former student, now OER assistant, uh, Trudy Radke and Brian Weston from College of the Canyons, and thank you to Lori Coleman and Philip Anaya from Alamo Colleges who shared uh, their amazing work and how they're creating awareness for students uh, around OER and low cost, and finally Megan Dempsey at Raritan Valley. So we are open for questions, or if, um, my, if any of our speakers would like to make some comments um, as well, any closing remarks, uh, we are open for that as well. I'll just add something really quick. This is Brian Weston from College of the Canyons. Uh, I didn't quite touch on it, but the student workers or the student helpers that you have are really also great at helping promote. Uh, they tend to know what students are using at the college for social media. Uh, hint, it's not Yahoo groups, it's not AOL typically, it's, you know, it's a few other platforms, but it's just really nice to get that perspective and be like, how can I engage or, you know, what kind of graphic would best uh, you know be representative to really attract those students so just kind of wanted to throw that out there as well thank you for sharing that brian i think that's uh very very useful um that most faculty are probably not using uh, some are but many are not using the same social media platforms and i just wanted to make a correction Paige's question about is alamo open just for oer or does it encompass other free and low cost materials. And I think I said that it does, but actually uh, for our Alamo Open, it's not low cost, but it's free or no cost. So open or no cost. I just wanted to make that correction as well. Thank you, Lori. And I can just respond to a question from Pola in the chat. Um, how did Caitlin reach the students? Where were they gathered? So this was a meeting of our Student Government Association leaders. So there was about maybe 10 of them or so. It was their regular weekly meeting that they had and Caitlin was kind enough to fit that into her schedule and come and meet with them on two separate occasions. Wonderful. Thank you, Megan. Um, and Rich had a comment here, um, and I'm not sure exactly who he directed it at, but um, he said, have you looked at working with the college uh, bookstore student advisory committee if your campus has one and its student workers? It sounds like a very interesting idea. Uh, 
we haven't done that just speaking from alamo colleges no we hadn't thought of that but i think that yeah i would agree that that would be an excellent opportunity to capture some of those students who are kind of on the front lines of you know those those who come to the bookstore and searching high and low to get the best deals so yeah i think that's a great idea great thank you Lori, and i i agree with rich's um suggestion there um I know in the past, it's sometimes um, the bookstore may not know why there isn't a textbook ordered for a class. And I'm not saying that's happening at any of these colleges because you've probably started to work those processes out, but sometimes the, the bookstore um, hasn't known in the past and that leaves a, a point of confusion. So making sure that they're included in the communications path, that there is an OER textbook that may be available free online, but there, there might be a print copy uh, through the bookstore or through some other mechanism. Any final comments, Trudy, that you'd like to share? Um, honestly, uh, well, I'd like to thank uh, Una for I think putting this on and the community college consortium for open education. Um, I'm happy to be a part of it. And yeah, I just, I think we, I think everyone had a lot of great things to say. And I just like to emphasize one more time that uh, I guarantee that on any community college, any college campus, there are really bright students that just want a chance to, to help out, to further their education, to further their skills to put something on the resume and to just genuinely help other students. Uh, I know that there's a lot here. I've met with them, I've talked with them. They're brilliant, they're willing. Um, so if you if you go out and look, you're definitely gonna find them. I think that's, that's what I'd like to say. Great, thank you Trudy for that, um, that pitch. I think that's a really important point that students, uh, find, find the students, they're there, you just have to, provide the opportunity. And I, I, I and thank you for thanking me for putting this on. You know, I have an advisory committee that helps us plan our webinar topics throughout the year. Um, and a number of those folks are on here today, um, uh, particularly Regina Gong, um, who was our professional development VP this year. She's actually hosting a um, OER um, a summit at her college today so I don't believe she's online but she helped us with planning these topics and um, we do try to include students but I have to say Trudy we were really lucky to um, have you today um, we we try to include students in the topics we don't often get a student so this is really special so thank you Yeah, and Trudy was being a little modest. I just posted a link to a, a psych book she just recently finished as well, so you guys can kind of see well, it's how still it's in still in works, but how the formatting and how the separation of concepts and ideas is starting to pan out and what that kind of looks like. It looks like a really nice book, and it's really a, a, a great treat to see that as a student, because sometimes you do run across OER, and it could be the most brilliant, well-written OER, but if it's just you know 400 pages of text, um, you're going to turn some students away from that. So I think just adding that, again, that stylistic um, component to really bring out those concepts is wonderful. So I just wanted to thank Trudy again. She's amazing. Yeah, and I wanted to ask something. Thank you. I agree. Trudy, Trudy is amazing. Uh, for you and, and Brian, maybe as well. Um, in my college, I remember when we had a focus group conversation with some of the chairs, one of the chairs of the biology department mentioned that the reason they don't adopt some OER text is because of the layout. And in fact, they said, you know, we like that the publisher provide, provides the students eBooks, and of course print books, but the eBooks are designed in ways that they, they mimic a print book. And so that students can modify the viewing of the eBook so that they can see pages that are meant to be side by side, side by side on the page. But they find that some of the OER versions of their course content don't offer that kind of viewing for students and it's just more frustrating for students that they can't see what they need to see uh, simultaneously on two different pages. Have, have you run into any of that or have you experienced any of that in terms of feedback maybe from students or faculty? Uh, I have actually and that is a really great point to bring up and I think that um, I think that that's been a, an, a complaint or at least a, an issue people have had with OER in the past for a while is 
you know, can, even with all the attention paid to it, can it, can it really mimic a textbook? Can it be on a textbook level? Will it look like something that a publisher produced? I definitely think that um, you can run into those issues. And I, I do think that creating um, aesthetically pleasing or publish-esque type of OER textbooks, it does create an opportunity to think outside the box. But I would also, um, I would also say that in the past couple of years, even a lot of new tech has been developed and people now that this is kind of the ball starting to roll and people are starting to get into this, I think that it's getting easier and easier almost every day to create textbooks that really are on publisher standards. I mean, we're still, I would say that we're still a bit of a ways off, but we're very close. We're much closer, I think, than we've ever been. And if you just dig a little, there really, there's a lot of free resources that you really can use um, to create these textbooks that, that really make them appealing. And then I, like I was saying in the aesthetics um, or style portion, the student doesn't feel cheated out of aesthetics or um, functionality, I think, which is kind of what you were getting at. There, there are ways to recreate that like a publisher would. It just takes maybe a little extra time and maybe I would say some extra tech knowledge. So if you have a student maybe that has tech knowledge or a faculty member or something, that definitely will help because it is a little techy, but it can be done. And I'll just add to that again. The beauty of OER is, you know, we're we're constantly updating and revising, and you know, when we get feedback from faculty and their students, um, they're actually bringing some of their textbooks back. We're modifying it and trying to really, again, work off the comments and uh, appreciate the loveliness of OER and the fact that we can update it, you know, in a quick manner and give it back to them for you know improvements and everything from there. So I think it's just OER is a wonderful tool to. You know, if you don't like it, let's make it even better. Or, you know, let's find that student to really, you know, bring that technology and upgrade it from there. So I, I think it's just a wonderful opportunity to revisit OER. Absolutely, I agree. Thank you both. And we we just had a question uh, from Mary Oram, um, who's from uh, Tri County Technical um, College in in uh, South Carolina, and she was asking about um, the ability to highlight and make notes in the text. Um, of OER and thank you Nathan um, Smith from Houston Community College who mentioned that um, this is something that the PDF reader can provide to a student so if the textbook is in PDF and they're using a reader that has that capability they can do the highlighting um, and sounds like we should do a webinar on that in the uh, you know in the near future as well and just to add to that, I think students who are pretty savvy in kind of like the digital highlighting and note taking, they tend to have a particular, in my experience, I'm sorry, that's my phone, they have a, um, a particular a tool or platform that they like to use for that. So the more variety of formats an OER is it available in, I think that sort of addresses that need in a way that a publisher ebook cannot, where they're probably much more limited in what what tools are available to them and what platform they can use it on. All right, thank you, Megan, for that as well. And um, I think at this point, we're going to stop the recorder and close the webinar. And once again, thanks so much to our speakers today. Um, this was a really rich learning experience for um, so many of us. Um, and thank you so much. <laughs>